we're going to connect with Kirk Smalley from Stand for the Silent, um, a very important organization that we're going to host some talks with. There we go. Hello, my friend. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good. I'm, I'm sorry really for good. the connection issues, and I'm sorry to those who had tuned in and tried to, to watch. So we're good now. All right. So let me first start by introducing what we're doing here. So Kirk Smalley is the co-founder of Stand for the Silent. It is a very important organization that is anti-bullying and suicide prevention and awareness and really starting the conversation with your children, other children, family members, your community. And we did an interview with Kirk where he shared his story. And as Kirk put it, there's so much more that needs to be said. So we are having a two-part conversation, um, Kirk and I, tonight. We will be talking about Kirk's message what you can do to um, prevent bullying and in turn, hopefully stop some of these suicides that we're seeing amongst young people. Kirk, I will hand it over to you. What is, um, how, how do you normally start these presentations when you give these talks, telling people how to start the conversation, how to have these conversations? And are you talking to mostly the parents or are you talking to the kids and telling them what they can do too? Uh, we talk to really Leslie, anybody that will listen. Um, you know, when I do the the anti-bullying presentations, I'm normally talking to school uh, kids, uh, teachers, administrators. Um, we do a lot of community events, uh, evening events that a lot of parents come to. And, you know, for all of my presentations, the way I normally start out is I tell them what happened to my son. Um, our, our son was 11 years old. His name was Ty, and Ty took his own life a little over 10 years ago uh, because of being bullied. And, you know, we tell Ty's story uh, in hopes that it, it – raises awareness to people to people to really let them know that they need to talk to their kids um, find out what's going on you know right now in America the statistics are, are just completely staggering um, one out of four of our children in the United States at this time actually has a plan on how they would take their own life before they graduate from high school. Did you say one out of four? One out of four, 25% will actually have a plan on how to take their own life before they graduate from high school. Um, wow. I don't know about y'all, but that number is completely unacceptable. Um, you know, when you lose a, a child to suicide, it is, it's devastating um, to everyone that loved him or her. Um, you know, God forbid anyone ever loses a child for, from anything. Um, you can lose a child in a car wreck and you have something to blame. You can lose a child to cancer or a disease and you have something to blame. When you lose a child to suicide, you blame yourself. For the rest of your life, you blame yourself. And so those numbers, one out of four, 25% of our babies having a plan on how they would take their own life before they graduate, I, I won't live with them. I will go to my grave to fight against that. You know, we, suicide is now the second leading cause of death in our young people in America, ages 10 to 24 years old. And it's second only to car wrecks. No, I have a, actually a, a list 
of over 66,000 children that we have lost to suicide due to being bullied in the United States of America in the last seven and a half years. Do the math. Over 66,000 in seven and a half years. That's almost one every hour. Leslie, we can't live in a world where our babies are taking their own lives without doing everything we can to fight against it. Now, you don't hear about all of them because most, most families don't want to talk about I mean, hell, it's, think about it. You don't even want to think about a child taking their own life. The youngest kid on the list of 66,000 that I have was a six-year-old boy. We have six-year-old kids taking their own lives. And it's time we learn to talk about that. And how would you start that conversation? What do you say when you give your talks to these parents? Like you said, I would assume most people don't want to talk about it. It's not my family. It doesn't apply to me. My kids are fine. Do you hear that a lot? Well, that's, you know, I, I do get that a lot. And, you know, when you think about the statistics, that one in four number, you have to realize that it's somebody's child. It, we hope that it's not ours. But one out of four? Are you really willing to bet on those odds? Because I'm not. I did. I didn't. I don't know. Going on forward on that, one of the things I do in, in my presentation and, and how I talk to parents, you know, we are, are Stand for the Silent, Laura, myself, and our boy Ty are in a documentary. It's available right now on Netflix. It came out in 2011. It was called Bully. It was directed by a guy named Lee Hurst. And it's a really eye-opening documentary. It truly is. Um, it's great to sit down and watch that with your kids. And it's a really good conversation starter. It, it actually makes it acceptable to talk about it, uh, you know, with, with your children. You know, one of the things I like to do during my presentations is I get messages literally by the thousands from kids and parents and, and school administrators and teachers that have have seen my presentation um, and I get literally hundreds and, and hundreds of messages from children that say I was that one in four Kirk I was going to kill myself tonight when mom and daddy went to sleep I had it planned out knew exactly how I was going to do it and I, I had planned on that and after hearing you and speak and and what you had to say I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, I, I can literally send you those type of messages, Leslie, and they'll break your heart, every single one of them. But I got this one email uh, in particular from a parent that is really eye-opening, and it helps other parents realize that they have to learn to have that talk and they have to learn to have that conversation. And I read that email at my presentation, uh, you know, for to the parents. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to read it right now. Absolutely, please. Okay. I'm not going to give the lady's name um, no. that sent email just for her privacy. Um, she said, Dear Mr. Smalley, please let me start by saying that I was deeply touched after hearing you talk Wednesday at Oklahoma Health Academy. I'm a student there, but more importantly, I'm a mother of two beautiful teenage boys. After hearing what your precious tie went through, it made me stop and think about my sons and how happy and healthy they seemed to be. So I decided to talk to them and see if they had had similar experiences away from home. Perfect was one of the hardest conversations I've ever had to have. I had a very abusive childhood. I'd been molested by a stepfather over a period of several years, 
And after finally getting the courage to tell my mother, she refused to believe me, and she turned a blind eye. Seeing no other way out, I began trying to take my own life. It was small things at first, you know, different pill combinations and such. And at the end of two long years, I'd finally had enough. So I came home. I locked myself in the bathroom. I took three dozen aspirin and I slit my wrists. I was found in time and taken to the hospital. But some wounds never heal. Now over time, I'd learned to block out the these things, and I never share my past with anyone. I certainly had never planned to do so with my children. But Kirk, I needed them to know that as a human, those feelings of hopelessness and pain, although sometimes normal, are not necessary. So I set them down, and I told them about Ty. And then I told them about my childhood. And then I asked them the hardest question of all. Had they ever considered suicide? Did they have a plan? Kirk, I was shocked by their answers. My 13-year-old said, yeah, he thought of it when he was angry at me for making him clean his room. But he didn't have an active plan. My 16-year-old said he'd considered it many times actually had many plans, most of which involved hanging himself. Now, I wish I could tell you that it was because of bullying. But as I had to hear this awful truth from my baby's own mouth, I owe it to him to be honest. See, my husband and I, we both grew up poor, and we've done everything to make sure that our children wanted for nothing. And in striving to give them this, we've often exhausted our patience before coming home to our babies. More often than not, the words, not now, I just need some peace and quiet, or we'll talk later, have been the first things out of our mouths. But you know what they heard? They heard, I don't have time for you. Your day is not important to me. I don't want you around. A long story short, after much more talking, I ended up begging forgiveness for my children for being so blind to what they really needed. And the four of us made a pact to spend more time as a family and work on our communications. Afterward, my 16-year-old Rick went to his room, and as he walked away, I could almost see the weight lift from his shoulders. I asked him if he felt better, and my reward was the brightest smile I've seen in years. About five minutes later, he poked his head out of his room, and he said, Mama, I want to give you something. And he gave me the most precious gift that I've ever received. He brought me the rope that he was planning to hang himself with. Kirk, he'd been hiding the hiding it under his bed for over six months. And he handed it to me and he said, here, Mama, I, I don't need this anymore. I will always be eternally grateful, grateful to you, Mr. Smalley. If I hadn't heard you speak, my baby would have been on your list one day. You saved my son's life. You saved our family. Thank you is hardly enough to say for what you've done. God bless you. <sighs> I'm overwhelmed. Listen, I did not read that to you and the people here with us to pat Kirk on the back. Mm -hmm. I read that email to tell you, show you that no, how, no matter how happy and healthy our children seem to be, one out of four of them has a plan. The importance of learning to talk to your children, to learn that communication, 
and have an open conversation about it with them will save their lives. You know, in today's day and age, we've forgotten how to communicate with our kids. We really, truly have. We don't eat dinner around a dinner table and have meaningful family conversations anymore. We eat dinner in front of a television set. You know, you can walk in any airport right now and 99% of the people are on some kind of an electronic device typing away. I was at a restaurant a while back. I sat down by myself. I looked over and I I saw a family of four. There was a mom, a dad, and two children, two, you know, teenage kids. Every single one of them was on a cell phone, just typing away. They weren't even talking. We I have definitely to learn. think. Oh, sorry. Say again. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you. I, I definitely think that genuine communication has slowed down tremendously because of, like you said, the electronics and everyone has one and we're not forced to communicate the way we used to. What advice would you give to parents or how would you tell them to approach the conversation, what do you say in your talks about actually starting that conversation? And before you answer, just so that you know, and so the people watching know, that movie, Bully, I saw that movie. That's how I learned about you and your wife and your son and your story and your organization. And that's when I started following you and wanting to be a part of what you were doing to change the world and to change what we, what we see happening. Um, but anyway, back to what part of your um, talks really speaks to the parents and, and really what would you tell them to say or what, what are some key words or things that might get them over the hump and get the lump out of their throat? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, we, we have to realize um, that suicide is not a taboo subject to speak about. By talking about suicide, it's not going to make a child take their own life. It's not. You know, that is is one of the stigmas that, that the word suicide has. You know, if someone in your family took their own life, and, ooh, there's something wrong with those people, you know. And and that, that truly is, you know, when, when Laura and I lost Ty, we lost every friend that we had. Every single one of our friends. That is so, that is so shocking you know, to me to hear. For the first couple of weeks, maybe the first month or two, we, we got invited to the, the 4th of July barbecues. We got invited to, to go and, and be part of, of the get togethers with our friends. And they would talk about their children. They'd say, Timmy's in football this summer, and he's doing great. And Sally, she's, she's in cheerleading, and she's doing wonderful. And so Laura and I, we would, we would talk about our baby. Because even though he wasn't with us anymore, he was still the most important part of our lives. And we love him dearly. And we miss him every second of every day. And so we would talk about Ty. And I guess that made them uncomfortable. Because they didn't know what to say. You know, and when, when you lose someone to suicide, you get all the standard. If you need anything, anything at all, just call. Day or night, anytime, just call. If you just need somebody to talk to, just call. You get, uh, he's in a better place. He's not in my arms where he belongs. 
you know people don't know what to say so they fall back on those type of things but then they don't stand behind them a lot of times so we have to realize that suicide is not a taboo subject and by speaking about it with our children it's not going to make them do it it's probably just the reverse it's going to actually let them know that if they have those thoughts and they have those feelings it's okay to come to mom and dad and talk to them about it and we can talk it out. We don't have to act it out. So, you know, that, that is first and foremost. Before you ever talk to your children, you have to, to settle that within yourself, that it's okay to talk about it. This is not something that's going to create it. Um, it's just the opposite. By talking about it, we let them know that it's okay to have those thoughts and feelings because one out of four kids do most of those one out of four think that they're the only ones Leslie that have ever thought about taking their own lives they think they're all alone in this world they're the only ones that have ever had that thought they don't realize that one out of four children have that thought and they're not alone in it and there are people out here not just mom and dad and family members that care and we want to help. And that's what you're doing here tonight. Leslie, you care. You want to help. I really that's do. They care. She, she cares. She, they want to help. That's why the people that have logged in are here tonight. Once we have realized that amongst ourselves, that it's okay to talk about this, that we can have these conversations, the best way to do it is, like I say, either watch the movie, uh, the documentary Bully. Uh, you, can, you can get one of my presentations online. I'll make it easy for you to open that conversation with your children. Because you sit down and watch a night with your kid, and those kids are going to have questions all through it. And they're going to want to want to connect and talk and hug and and just you know get whatever weight is is hanging around their neck off of it. And so that's going to open that ability to talk. You, after the movie or after one of my presentations, turn and look at them. Have you ever had those thoughts? And if you, as an adult, have had those thoughts, relate that to them. You know, when I was in high school growing up, I never thought of suicide. But if I had, and I wanted to let my kids know that it's okay to talk about it, I'd confess to that. I would say, Ty, you know, when I was growing up, I, I thought about taking my own life a few times. I even had it, had it planned out one time. And sometimes, you know, things get pretty heavy. And we feel like we're all alone in this world. And we feel like we can't talk about it to, to people because they are going to think we're crazy. And they're going to try to put us in a wacky house or something like that. But you know what? We're not crazy. Those are normal feelings that some people get sometimes. And instead of being afraid of them, we need to learn to communicate about them, talk about them with each other. And we can get through this together because you are not ever alone. I think you know, that that's the biggest thing that you, the biggest takeaway for me is, is sharing with the parents to share with their children um, the movie, the videos, but have that conversation about them not being alone. And going back to even what you said about um, the letter that you received and how the communication about the parents being so busy and not having time probably makes them feel even more alone. Yeah. And anything that can be done to make them feel that they're not even, I know when I was growing up, no matter what was going on, we all had dinner together. And I know that in today's world, that's a little tough 
with, like you said, people working so hard to put food on the table for their kids and to be the best parents that they can be and to give them a life they didn't have. Um, but along the way, like you said, you have to remember to communicate with them and have the conversations, no matter what those conversations are about and let them have the ability. I know my parents always told me and my mom was always telling me, doesn't matter what it is, you can talk to me. Yeah. You know, and here's another thing that, that I have seen, and I see this a lot, you know, some of the, some of the kids or a lot of the kids that come to me after my presentation, either in person, they'll want to come up and hug and connect after the, after I speak or they, they find me online on social media and they, they, you know, private message me, shoot me an email, whatever. They feel like they can't talk to their parents. Not all children and have a relationship like you did, Leslie, with their their mom or or their yeah. their parent. Um, it's it's tough. Um, it is a fact of life nowadays, though. A lot of kids don't don't have that ability to talk about serious subject matter with their their parents. Um, they can't talk about it with a school teacher. They can't talk about it with a school counselor. It, th those people are too close sometimes. Um, parents, counselors, teachers, someone they see every day, and they're afraid to talk to them openly and honestly about such a subject as suicide. And you gotta, you got to admit, it would be really, really tough. That would be one of the hardest things for a child to do, is walk up to mom and daddy and say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm thinking about killing myself. And I've, I've actually had a plan on how to do that. And that would be hard. That would be one of the most difficult things. I would imagine that that would most likely never happen for a multitude of reasons, a lot yeah. of which you've touched on. I would think that, especially if the kids feel that they're all alone in this and yeah. that nobody cares about them or that nobody would miss them, what would motivate them to talk to their parents? Exactly, and that is part of the reason why I get so many messages, so many emails from children that I've spoken to uh, that have heard my presentation, they they message me on Facebook Messenger, you know, on Instagram, on on Twitter. They they'll find you, you know. Um, they're good on social media, and they they find me and they and they they message me and they they say, you know what, I I feel like I can talk to you. You get it. You understand. And I don't think you're going to judge me for, for having these thoughts and these feelings. And I think I can talk to you. And Kirk, I have a plan. And I'll say, you mean you had a plan? And they say, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. I had a plan. And I still get kids that I might have spoken to eight or nine years ago that, that message me and say, you know, I saw something that made me think of you today. Or I've still got the wristband that you gave me that says I am somebody and I wear it every day. Um, Someone that's watching now commented that they still have the wristband from when you came and spoke at their school. Um, people are commenting about um, all kinds of things, asking different questions, most of which you're, you're answering as you speak. So I haven't really gone back to them. Um, but I know we're getting close to our, our time tonight with everyone and I definitely don't want to cut this short before we've touched on important things but um what would you recommend there's another person still has their wristband this is like touching my heart so much and i'm so grateful to everyone for tuning in i'm grateful to kirk for taking the time like you mentioned this is something that i am extremely passionate about this subject means a lot to me um saving these kids means the world to me 
um, basically, um, what, what would you say to a parent that's watching now? Um, I would assume a lot of everything that you had already said, but if they're still struggling with the conversation, how would they reach out to you? Could they reach out to you? What, how would they do that? I would say, I mean, first and foremost, if, if anyone out there needs help talking to your kids about this, uh, yeah, reach out to me. I'm I'm more than willing. I I will literally do whatever needs to be done to help you. Um, I mean that. Hi, Otis. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, my personal email is Kirk K I R K at standforthesilent dot org, and. I, I will literally do whatever it takes to help you open this conversation. If you have a child that has those thoughts and you know about that and, and you're having trouble finding the help they need and, and helping them, I will help you any way, shape, or form. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. If we can save one baby, one child from doing what happened to my son, then it's worth whatever I have to give. Um, you know, like I said, that we've, we've got to start talking about it, you know, and we can start easy. We can have, you know, watch the movie, the documentary Bully, uh, and then gradu gradually ease into a conversation with them about it. And then the next day, follow up, you know, uh, and then eventually you can, you can say, have you ever had thoughts like that? Just out of curiosity. You know, it doesn't have to be all at once. Just kind of gradually ease into it. Let them know that, and let them get a sense of comfort talking about that kind of thing with you. Um, you know, if that fails and you, you don't feel like you can do that or they won't open up, here's another thing real quick. Um, you know, one of the things I also do in my evening presentations to, to adults and parents is I'll ask or I'll ask, okay, how many of you in here right now have ever asked your children every day when they get home from school, um, how was your day? And boy, the hands will go up. You know, there might be 200 people out there in the audience and 199 hands are in the air. And I'll say, okay, what do the kids say? To the, to the question, how was your day? And they say, well, uh, it was fine. It was good. It was okay. And then I say, and then what? Well, they, they go to their room and they get on their computer, maybe do their homework and get on social media. See, Leslie, that's not communicating. That's going through the motions. You ask your children, how was your day? And they say it was fine every single day. Because they think that's what you want to hear and they want out of that conversation. They don't want to talk about it. Not with mom and dad. So instead, we got to start following up with that question, how was your day? And when they say fine, we don't accept fine for an answer. Instead, we say, what good thing happened to you today? Tell me one good thing that happened to you. What bad thing happened to you today? Tell me a bad thing. And then we learn to talk about those things. Well, how did that make you feel? And then we can use those as life lessons as well. And we say, well, if it made you feel that bad that somebody called you that or did that, can you imagine if we did that to another and we caused someone to feel that bad about themselves? But we don't always want to be just the negative. We want to have the positive in there, too. Oh, that good thing that happened to you? 
How'd that make you feel? And can you imagine being able to make someone else feel that way about themselves? And if we cover both sides of that base, what we're doing is we're allowing our kids to feel comfortable talking about us, or talking to us rather, not only about the good things, but about the bad things. And that's how we got to start into those conversations. You know, I think next week we're going to talk about some warning signs. Is that not what you, what we had planned? Yes. So as we close out tonight's conversation, I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank the people who have watched and popped in, popped out, stayed on the whole time. The comments, lots of questions about, as Kirk answered them through about, about starting the conversation, about what to say. Um, a lot of comments from people sharing how they had felt and what they've been dealing with um, and how inspiring and, and how much they appreciate what you're doing um, have come through. So I don't know if you've seen them all. Um, can you um, possibly repeat your email for someone? Yeah, I'll type it in right now in the comments. Okay. So as Kirk types in his email in the comments, um, I'll also make sure that once I post the video, we include that. We include the name of the movie um, that everyone can find to really start talking. And thank you um, for the comments and, and saying that you look up to, to both of us. And we appreciate that. We, I know for me, I just really like to tap into what Kirk is doing and the programs that he's running. And, you know, if you or any of your children um, are interested in starting a chapter of Stand for the Silent in your community, reach out to Kirk. I know that's a huge, huge thing in the way to, to keep the conversation going. Um, as Kirk mentioned, this is a two-part conversation. We will be talking again next Thursday about warning signs, what to look for. And, you know, like Kirk mentioned in the beginning, one out of four. If it's not you and or your children, maybe it's their friend, but somebody needs this information. And so we're here to help share it. Um, I'm just the platform. Kirk is the information. He is the driving force. Um, he is Stand for the Silent, him and his wife and their team. And I am beyond grateful and honored that you chose my platform to come and share your information on. And I, I'm humbled by everyone that has watched. And I thank you again, Kirk, and I look forward to next Thursday's conversation. I look forward to it as well. And, you know, Leslie, I think if, if any of the people on here, uh, or I'm, I'm sure that we'll probably post this live feed on, on our social media as well as yours so that others can watch that, that weren't able to be here on the live feed. Um, but if anybody has any particular topics uh, as far as the suicide and bullying topics and want to continue the conversation after next Thursday, I'm more than willing, you know, I, I am not an expert. I am not a trained counselor. I am a broken hearted daddy that misses my baby boy every second of every day. And I've learned so much that you guys need to know. I learned it too late and I don't want it to be too late for you and for yours. And if you guys actually, like I say, you, you have more than, than the subject we covered tonight on how to open up a conversation, uh, the subject that we're going to cover next Thursday on some of the warning signs to look for, uh, for, for suicidal, uh, ideation, then um, if, if, if those don't cover what you, you want to talk about, you let Leslie and I know uh, what you want to talk about, uh, what you need to know, the, the questions you have. And Leslie and I will, I'm sure I can speak for her too, because I see I've, I've only really been communicating with Les, Leslie for a short time, but I've seen her heart. And I know the kind of loving, caring person she is. And 
I am positive that if it would help one person in our world, that she will do whatever she needs to do as well. And Absolutely. she'll come back on and we'll cover whatever you guys need to cover. And thank you, Otis. Thank you, Kirk. And yes, I do care. I care about every human being that is out there. And I think that we all deserve to be heard. Everyone deserves a voice. And everyone needs to know that, like you said, there is someone out here rooting for you all the time. So thank you, Kirk. And we will connect again next week. Thank you, everyone. And good night.